Mentor, student, teacher, brother, protector. This is the evolution of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Knowing behind the scenes lore is just as much part of loving Star Wars as watching the final products, and the creation of Obi-Wan Kenobi is a celebrated part of that lore. In crafting his modern myths steeped in the nostalgia of what moved him as a kid, George Lucas knew his sprawling space saga would have a classic mentor role. Even after drafts of The Star Wars changed and morphed into the classic film that launched the saga, the mix of generations was at the heart of the story. The character that would become former Jedi Knight turned crazy old wizard was always key to that. He was there as the old to guide the new. Lucas had originally sought out legendary actor Toshiro Mufuni, a veteran of the Akira Kurosawa films that had a powerful hold on George's creative brain, but the actor turned down the role, so Lucas turned his gaze toward another legend, Sir Alec Guinness. Though he would famously gain the reputation of not liking the Star Wars movies that introduced him to a new generation of audiences and made him a little extra pocket change thanks to his much-discussed-at-the-time back-end percentage deal, the distinguished, refined, London-born actor took the role because he was interested in playing the mentor in a morality play. And thus the foundations of Obi-Wan were built. With his reserved strength and purpose laced with wariness and a sense of impending doom, Guinness used every scene as Kenobi to be the framework for the larger story unfolding around him and left enough space between his lines for an entire lifetime of the character to be found. You fought in the Clone Wars? Yes. I was once a Jedi Knight, the same as your father. As George Lucas described Guinness in the role while looking for his Qui-Gon Jinn in 1997, he was the center of this movie about hope, and compassion winning the day. The Ben Kenobi that emerges from the Tatooine wastelands to pick up Luke and send him on his way is a soul that knows his role in the adventure racing around him is of a different nature than the ones he had experienced before. This is no longer his fight. And even though the princess in the recording is calling on him to join the cause and save the day like he used to in those Clone Wars of old, this crazy old wizard knows that his purpose is to make sure hope survives and that the hero to be heeds the call before him. It is the generational change at the heart of the Star Wars saga, the reason George Lucas sat down to write out his morality tale for the 12 year olds of every era. The mentor needs to tell the next hero the truth. This is your fight now. And that journey may also include some painful losses. Though the character was not originally written to die in A New Hope, Kenobi met his end as we were all just getting to know him. And with his apparent death and mysterious vanishing at the hand of his former student Darth Vader, Kenobi shared his final lesson with all of us, that we all must move on from loss and death. That leaving the comfort of home, the safety and security of which Kenobi represents in A New Hope will be fraught with peril. We have to keep on running. Something Kenobi spent a lifetime learning before his voice yelled, Run, Luke, run. As the story continues, Kenobi's ghostly self returns to Luke during his moments of need, a comforting voice when he needs to believe in a guiding presence full of insight, and at times, let's be honest, certain points of view that leave out the important bits of information for Luke to discover when he's ready, or even when he's not. However, despite starting a seemingly endless discussion in the fandom about what Kenobi should or should not have told Luke about his father, sister, and whether or not he was right about the son of Skywalker being the last hope for the galaxy, the log-sitting, riddle-spewing Force Ghost Kenobi that remains provides more hints to the scars earned and wisdom gained from a long life of adventuring we had yet to see. The adventures of Obi-Wan Kenobi continued or began depending on what generation of fandom you're from when George Lucas took us all back to the beginning of the Skywalker saga in 1999. This allowed us to see Kenobi in a different light. The road to wise old wizard was still out in front of him, and as a youngling not too far removed from his birth on planet Stujan, Obi-Wan had begun his journey to a Jedi a little brash and definitely rebellious. To help in his refinement and perhaps push him more toward the tenets of the Order, Jedi leaders like Yoda found it a good idea to pair him with a Jedi that often challenged the status quo, Jedi not afraid to push boundaries. So with that, young Obi-Wan Kenobi found himself as the Padawan learner of Qui-Gon Jinn. The two were constantly at odds with each other, with Qui-Gon often struggling with the best way to teach the student he was having trouble communicating with, and Obi-Wan struggling to look past his emotions and struggling with his teacher's constant smudging of the rules and desire to pick up all the life forms along the way. 
Lucas structured this debate between them as a difference over the mythological role of the guide and the trope of the beggar on the street. Qui-Gon saw the value of Jar Jar Banks and soon after Anakin Skywalker as fate brought them onto their path forward. On the other hand, Obi-Wan, despite having a fundamental understanding of the importance of these symbiotic relationships in the galaxy, felt these newfound allies would slow them down. I believe, actually, that Obi-Wan called them pathetic life forms. Obi, tisk tisk. This set up the biggest steps forward in his own evolution. The lightsaber duel on Naboo forever changed Kenobi and the galaxy at large. As the younger Jedi in the fight, Kenobi is a bouncing ball of aggression that leans toward rage, especially after he watches Darth Maul pierce the heart of his teacher. Driven by vengeance and about to give in to all of his worst emotions, Kenobi leaps into action and is almost killed alongside his master for it. It is not until he calms himself, finds his center, and as Qui-Gon said, lets his focus determine his reality, does he defeat Maul in this fight. Then he is faced with his biggest challenge yet. The role that he was against, the guide who takes on the least of them on the street, is now his. With his dying breath, Qui-Gon thrusts the role of Anakin's teacher, and more importantly, a father figure, to Obi-Wan Kenobi, and the adventure continues. Now a Jedi Knight with Anakin as his Padawan, Obi-Wan Kenobi is firing on all cylinders as we meet up with him again in Attack of the Clones. As is often the case in our real world, the former brash student is now the rule-following teacher. With his well-manicured beard and mullet, iconic in his galaxy and ours, Kenobi has become the poster child for the Jedi Order. In the ten years since we last saw them, Obi-Wan and Anakin have formed quite the team and experienced many adventures. But the Shroud of the Dark Side is about to fall, and Obi-Wan finds himself at the center of one of the most important arcs in the saga, and in a chapter of his life in which threads start to unravel in his picture-perfect existence. In terms of plot, Obi-Wan Kenobi is playing the role of the classic film noir gumshoe, a private detective hot on the trail of the clues to solve the big mystery of who tried to kill Senator Padme Amidala. It's a case that will take him from a very film noir-like diner to the far reaches of the galaxy, all while learning more and more about the truth behind it all. It's classic stuff, but in reality, the character of Obi-Wan is standing at the intersection of knowledge and wisdom, and the lessons of the important differences between the two. At this time in Kenobi's life, the Jedi Order is full of knowledge, which should be the case for the warrior monks that use their powers for knowledge and defense, but they are certainly lacking wisdom and Kenobi's pursuit of the truth behind the assassination attempt of Padme finds him constantly facing down this difference. When trying to learn about the darts used by Jango Fett to kill his hired gun Zam Wessel, the analysis droids of the Jedi Order can't trace them, so Kenobi goes to the comfortable surroundings of his favorite local diner, where the friendliest basilisk in the galaxy, Dexter Jetster, provides him the information he needs based off the lived-in wisdom he has of the galaxy. They're Kamino's saber darts, don't you know? But when trying to find Kamino itself, the Jedi Archives can't provide him the knowledge he needs. It's the unencumbered mind of a youngling in Yoda's care that gives him the wisdom he needs to reveal the next step in his journey. And this all leads him to being held captive on Geonosis, where Count Dooku shakes his foundations, makes him question all he knows, and challenges his very trust in the Order itself by unveiling some dark truths. The knowledgeable Jedi Order is falling, they lack the wisdom to stop it. And before he can do anything about it, before they can do anything about it, begin the Clone War does. And like all other Jedi around him, Kenobi is now in a role not made for a Jedi, that of a general. The war is raging around him and every corner of the galaxy is affected and aflame. General Kenobi continues to be an exemplary Jedi and an unbreakable warrior. Though Anakin is now a Jedi Knight with his own headstrong Padawan, Kenobi remains close with Skywalker and sees him as a brother, though Anakin still might need a parental figure more than anything. That Kenobi is unbreakable in his spirit is an important character trait that should serve as a beacon for the still-learning Anakin, a lesson in releasing yourself from attachments, a lesson the emotion-fueled Anakin is still having trouble learning. Yet time and time again, we see examples of the Jedi General Kenobi constantly having his resolve tested. He is unbreakable, yes, but he is constantly taking beatings out in the galaxy, many times literally. Seriously, Kenobi takes a lot of punches in the Clone Wars. 
All this shows that while he can seem like the Jedi that has it all together, the one who continues to stand strong and not break, never fully giving in to his emotions, never letting his attachments break him, never letting fear and pain turn to anger and hate despite all that, Kenobi is not without struggles. This is never more clear than when it is learned that Mr. Snarky himself was once in love, and let's be honest, still in love with Duchess Satine of Mandalore, and she knows the collection of hyperbole and half-truths called Obi-Wan Kenobi quite well. She pushes him on the idea that the Jedi have forsaken their vows by actively taking sides in the war and challenging his own understanding of attachment, letting go, and following the rules. Unfortunately, this great leader of Mandalore and source of peaceful change in the galaxy is murdered by the ghost of Kenobi's past. Maul returns, kept alive by the hatred for the Jedi he felt destroyed his existence and robbed him of his place of power and purpose. Seething with rage and fueled by vengeance, he wants to make Kenobi feel the same pain that stirs inside of him. Maul tries to break Kenobi. He murders Duchess Satine right in front of him. Kenobi is hurt. He is devastated. He is horrified. But Obi-Wan Kenobi never gives in to hate. He does not break. The revelation of his love for Duchess Satine and his ability to not break is also an important step in Kenobi's relationship with Anakin, who, as we all know, is harboring his greatest attachment from everyone his love and relationship with Padme. It should be a talking point for both of them, a chance for Kenobi to sit down with Anakin and talk about the secret he already knows is true. But both struggle to take that path, despite attempts to discuss it. Kenobi is a reluctant father figure, more comfortable now in the role of brother. So the issue is left unresolved, and Anakin finds someone else who is more willing to take on that role of father figure. The evolution of Obi-Wan Kenobi hits a bit of a snag as the Clone War comes to a close and the Sith get ready to take their revenge. He finally breaks. As the dark side of the Force stops simply swirling around the galaxy and begins to overtake it, Kenobi is faced with his most challenging quest yet. He must confront his former student, the embodiment of the last promise he made to Qui-Gon and his brother, Anakin Skywalker, and save him. Because, as Padme believes, they are still good in him. Or Kenobi must kill him in the trine. With each beat of truth about Anakin's fall to the dark side and emergence as Darth Vader, the controlled, measured, and well-trained Obi-Wan Kenobi starts to find his foundations cracking, and by the time he stands before him amongst the fiery landscape of Mustafar, Kenobi is trying to maintain a loose hold on all that he knows and is. His heart breaks, his soul shatters, and he tries at every step to stop what seems to be inevitable until he strikes down the newest Sith apprentice of the Phantom Menace turned Emperor with unlimited power, Sheev Palpatine. But then, Obi-Wan Kenobi fails. Anakin Skywalker has not been saved, and Darth Vader is not dead. And Kenobi, finally broken, heads into hiding with the task of protecting Luke Skywalker. Nearly 20 years later, Maul's reignited quest for vengeance and rebel rouser turned burgeoning Jedi Ezra Bridger's quest for Maul brings us all to a quiet campsite in the Tatooine night. And Obi-Wan Kenobi, would seem, has been waiting for us all. He sends Ezra on his way, knowing that this isn't his fight and the Force needs him elsewhere, and then faces Maul one last time. This is a thematic battle of change versus growth, purpose versus vengeance, peace versus suffering. Maul tries one last time to break Kenobi. He sees Kenobi as a rat in the desert, someone who once had it all, a place in the Jedi Order, a celebrated hero, and a respected presence in the larger story. Now, from Maul's point of view, he has nothing. No one is in his life. He holds no grand position. He is a living ghost. But Obi-Wan Kenobi is not affected by that. He is accepted no longer being what he once was in the eyes of the galaxy and feels as though he has risen above all the pain, suffering, and loss. It is Maul cannot accept the things he has lost. And that is when Maul senses Kenobi's final purpose. He is here to protect someone. And that is when the old crazy wizard stands to fight. For knowledge and defense, they used to say, and now the former Jedi Knight stands ready to defend the one he feels is the chosen one. His lightsaber drawn, he first stands in his old familiar fighting stance before switching to that of his old master Qui-Gon. And it's more than a touching ode to his former mentor slain at the hands of this hateful soul. It is a sign that he knows Maul has not changed. He's remained attached to what he once was, and like all dark side users, he refuses to let go. Maul will try to use the same moves he did some 30 years ago. And with a few quick slashes of his lightsaber, Kenobi finds Maul dying in his arms. He doesn't celebrate. He shows his pained rival empathy and compassion, and Maul dies in the arms of the man he spent a lifetime trying to kill. 
Kenobi's purpose, his final mission, remains in place. Something changed in Kenobi's heart during those years left in isolation, and it's part of his journey we've still yet to learn. How did he heal from his greatest failure ever on Mustafar, the collapse of his beloved Jedi Order, and his belief that Anakin was the Chosen One? It seems as though Kenobi faced down the cracks in his soul, perhaps trying one more time to turn Anakin or destroy Vader, and then, no matter the result, turn that important page in the book of his life, let it all go, and accept that his hope, the galaxy's hope, is found in the promise of the next generation, and that he must do what he was doing when he first entered the story in 1977. Obi-Wan Kenobi must protect Luke Skywalker, the embodiment of that new hope.